Good morning and welcome and Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kitshanu B'mitzvotah V'tzivanu V'asok B'divrei Torah. Amen. So uh, we are, of course, dealing with uh, the issues of Kohanim and how they have to act with tremendous purity and my sense that this all has to do with issues of immortality and uh, and the nature of our own lives and understanding a, a unique understanding of what our lives really are about. So uh, let me go ahead and go into the text. Give me one moment. Okay, here it goes. And uh, maybe part of the reason I'm losing people is because uh, this is arcane stuff, admittedly. At least it sounds like it. And one has to be really open and willing to, uh, you know, just ha ha open enough to listen to this and, and then see, allow your mind to try and come through with what it's about. So anyway, here we go. So there's this warning. We just started, as you can see, this is verse three. We just started chapter 22. And this is going to be, we were talking about certain issues that prevent a Kohen uh, from being able to uh, participate in the ritual, et cetera, of presenting the offerings, et cetera, or consuming them. Uh, but we also here are talking about spiritual issues. That's what we're going into now. Emor Alehem, say to them, this is to remember to Aaron and his sons and the Sanhedrin. Lador Techem, for all your generations. So this isn't just immediate, but for all generations. Kol Ish Asher Yikrav, any person who this says draws near. And we will see that uh, how Rashi is going to go into this in quite a lot of detail as to what it means when it says to draw near. And it might, you know, drawing near might be understood as meaning to touch, right? Mikol Zarachim, and now it's saying from all your seed and all, all your offspring, subsequent offspring, El HaKodashim, to the sacred donations, Asher Yakdishu Bnei Israel Lashem, which the children of Israel offer to God, to Hashem, the Tum Ato Alav, as long as his impurity remains upon him. In other words, while he's impure, which, by the way, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a, a, a glance forward, and that implies that the impurity is not one that's permanent that it's only as long as he is impure that this is talking about. So it's important to understand that. And just to finish off this, and here we go in terms of what I was saying as far as it has to do with immortality. That soul will be cut off, or that individual, it literally means soul, but it means individual will be cut off milifanai, from before me, Ani Hashem, I am the Lord. So amazingly enough, this kind of stuff has huge implications uh, with regards to its consequences, um, as we can see from this verse. Now, the thing I do need to tell you is that it it is a it is only there as long as a person doesn't do tshuva. If a person is able to atone for what they've done wrong, then they can uh, they can um, make sure this does not happen to them. So there is always that possibility of resolution regarding these kinds of things. Let's take a look at this Rashi now. Hold on to your yarmulkes. So, kol ish asher yikrav, any one who draws near, ein kriva zo ela achila. So Rashi says something quite remarkable, based, of course, on the tradition. He's not coming up with this himself. This is a very ancient tradition. And we're saying this drawing near, in other words, or touching, right, refers to eating, eating, to consuming, not simply touching. 
And so we find we find, and what leads us to this conclusion is that we have explicit an explicit mention of consuming sacred donations, the Tuma, in a state of impurity, the Lashon Negi'a, with using this, uh, this terminology of touching. So, for example, he gives you this example, the whole Kodesh Lotiga, you shall not touch any sacred object as long as one is in a state of of impurity. But again, there's a context. We're, we're, let's, we're going to keep going on. Rashi is saying this only as to explaining why it's using this word yikrav, okay? Because this this is something, this is an expression, the way the Torah expresses eating in this particular way. Again, we haven't had the proof yet, but it, I believe it's going to come up. Azhara le'echol right? This is, in fact, using this, right? And and going back to chapter uh, chapter 12 of Leviticus, we see that, in fact, it talks about eating there. Azhara le'echol. It is a, a warning not to consume it, even though it introduced it by talking about negia touching. And our sages have learned this out from the comparison of one context to the other context. In other words, here it's talking about yikrav, drawing near, which sounds like touching. And in another place where it talked about touching, where it speaks about touching, there it's explicit that it refers to eating. So here too, we say it's referring to eating. And one cannot say, you cannot argue that one is going to be uh, liable to karate for just simply touching this object in a state of, that you're in a state of impurity and you've touched this object that is in a pure state. And of course you do render it impure, but nevertheless, the consequences are not what they are here, which is karate. Here we go. Shehare ne'emar karet al ha'achila, because in parsha pitzav et aharon, because in the parsha tzav et aharon, command Aaron. That's the second parsha in uh, in Leviticus. Okay, that it there it says specifically that the punishment of karet is for eating, for consuming the sacrifice. So the question is, if here go, here's how the argument is. If the punishment for karate is for touching, right, then why is it also the punishment for eating, right? Because, and we're going, I'm going to go on with this now, but hopefully you're getting the sense of the logic here, right? Okay. Krita zo, zo, etzo zo. In other words, why do we have both the punishment for eating being karate and the punishment for touching right next to each other. Because if he is, he is, if the consequences are karate for simply touching it, then you don't have to say about eating because when you eat something, right, it's automatic that you're going to touch it. So why does the Torah go and then say about eating as well? So, that's the reason why you take the one that's more serious, which is, of course, consuming consuming it and saying that the karate refers to the eating of it. And karate, even though it's prohibited, karate is not a punishment for simply touching it. And this is the way it's expounded out in, in the Sifra. Vechi yesh nogea chayav is in fact they, the way they say it is. Can you say that the one who touches it touches it is liable for karate? Imkain matamud lama yikrav. Then why does the why does Torah the Torah say that he shouldn't draw near to it? 
Mish. So what is the purpose of that language, right? It still leaves that question out there. It's still begging that question. Why is the Torah using such language? And the answer is, Mish yikasher le, le, le hakrave. In other words, it, this applies, this law applies only when the offering, this dedicated food, the sanctified food, is in fact valid for and appropriate to be put on the altar. She'en chayaviv alav mishum tuma, because one is not going to be liable for touching this thing when one is in a state of impurity. Ela imkein, unless kirvu matirav, unless the permitted portions of it, that is the portions that are permitted to be eaten, have been properly offered up. Ve'im tomar shalosh kritot betumat koanim lama, right? But on the other hand, we have these three punishments, right? Three different situations where the punishment is karate, right? With regards to someone being in an impure state and consuming this uh, this meat, okay? Why is it mentioned three times? So the uh, tumat kwanim, when it comes to priests being in a state of impurity, it has already been expounded or explained in the tractate of Shavuot, uh, which is oaths. Okay, achat lichlal. One is to give the general prohibition of touching something in a state of impurity. And one example is, is regarding a specific offering in which one has done such a thing, that this is the punishment for it. The And Rashi doesn't give the third example here. He just says, etc. Right? So the, I looked it up, and it says the third one is to teach. This should be a T. I'm sorry. Let me see if I can take that out there to teach regarding an offering that depends, in other words, there's a specific type of offering that is brought depending on a person's financial circumstances. And you may recollect our studying that, that there was a, that in the case of a person who is financially sound, it, you might have to bring a, an ox or a, or a calf or something like that. And then if you're not financially sound, then you could bring birds. And if you still couldn't even afford birds, you could bring a meal offering. You may recollect that. that it come, and that such an offering comes to atone for being in a state of impurity. So again, let's get that in there. Uh, when entering the sanctuary or eating sanctified food. So again, that's the context there that it has to do with with consuming uh, consuming uh, uh, an offering uh, that this kind of offering going on the tumato alav with and its and its impurity is imp upon him, him now the thing is that in Hebrew it's a, its impurity is upon him referring to the person in the Hebrew could also sustain while it is impure referring to the object itself. So that needs to be clarified, and that's what Rashi's going to do. The tumat adam alav, right? And it's saying he's saying, giving you the explanation that as long as the person himself is impure, yachol babasar akatuv medaber. Well, but it's possible that the alav actually refers to the impure meat. So the situation would be, right, that a person who's in a state of purity is consuming impure meat and that the Torah is prohibiting that and saying that that kind of situation is uh, is going to create a, a karate, a cutting off that person's soul. So is that a, that seems to be a possibility. So we want to be rigorous about it, right? The tumato shel basar alav, right? And the meat itself is what is impure, and it's talking about a person who's pure eating something that is impure. That's what scripture is referring to. Al you have to understand per force, mi mashmao, from the implications that are said here, right in this particular situation, lamad b'mi shetum ato. 
horachat mimenu, because it's going to say, okay, it uses the word, remember I mentioned before, that it talks about tumato alav, right? Its impurity remains on it. And he's going to explain that that phrase tells you that it has to be the kind of purity that can be removed. And if the meat is impure, it can never be removed. So the context here, this particular little phrase clarifies that it has to refer to the person and not the object itself, right? So that's that's what Rashi is telling us, okay? Uveta, sorry, let me find a place, right. tumato in other words, we're talking about someone from whose impurity can fly away. In other words, he can no longer be in a state. It's possible for him to cleanse himself from his impurity, right? That the scripture is talking about a situation where it's possible to cleanse oneself of the impurity. And that can only refer to to a human being, because he is able to purify himself through immersion. Uh, remember yesterday I said, we really get into some heavy duty explanations here. And if you need me to go back and have any questions about this, I'm happy to do it, but hopefully I'm doing a relatively decent job of explaining this. Last little piece, the nichrata, right, shall be cut off. And again, a rigorous examination of what Torah means here. So, and he says, cut off. What do we mean cut off? Yachol mitzadze lesadze. It could mean that he's cut off from living in one place and he goes and lives in a different place. In other words, some kind of exile, not, not the karate that I was talking about, Right. He can he is cut off from the place he's living, and he can go and inhabit another place. Could that be the karet we're talking about? Excuse me. Talmud Lomar, and for that reason, scripture teaches Ani Hashem. It ends that statement with right here, Ani Hashem. What's the purpose of that particular phrase? The Homakomani. I'm in every place because God is everywhere. You can't leave off one place and go to another place because God is in all places. So this may be enough for today, but I would be very, I'd be very happy if you would like to uh, let me know if you want to go on a little bit or if you want to stop and just ask some questions. Well, I have a question anyway. Sure, uh, sure. Uh, they, uh, they have to bathe themselves, change their clothes, and bathe themselves to to get the to become pure. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, the um, uh, when they uh, when the priests uh, uh, were uh, going to uh, appear themselves and their families, uh, they they also had to. Uh, bathe themselves and uh, change their clothes to um, to their uh, you know uh, uh, priesthood clothes uh, the same way uh, so they can be pure uh, and they had to conf conf confiscate not con uh, consecrate all the other tools in the in the uh, uh, Mishnah and, uh, and everything yeah. like that to yeah. be pure. Well, pure is a, is a word. That they got to be pure. Even the Israelites have to be pure when they bring their um, um, chick, uh, their birds or their yes uh, offerings to the yeah uh, for a uh, Thanksgiving or for a, mm -hmm. you know well being right. and so forth and right. so on. Well, pure is a word, but the trouble is, what is this thing that they had in the? Um, I don't know if you got to that point, but. Uh, the, the, there's two lambs. One lamb is is free to go to Azel. I don't know who Azel is. They take all the sins and put it on that lamb, and he goes to Azel. And the other one is killed, and uh, the blood is uh, sprinkled on the uh, altar a certain way uh, mm -hmm. to relieve the Israels of their sins. Mm -hmm. That is something I can't understand. Uh, who is Azel? Azazel. Yeah, okay. So Azazel is understood 
to mean, you know, basically a land that is not habited. Okay. There are those oh. who that Azazel was a name of a demon, but basically the traditional argue the traditional explanation is that the, that that particular uh goat, it's a goat, okay, is supposed to actually it's it's actually thrown off a cliff, is what actually happens. Okay. Oh. So again, um we may have to revise our understanding of what it is to die, you know, and what the nature of mortality is. Um, but again, these are all different. They're all simply different ways referring to different, different levels of impurity because you can become impure through a whole bunch of different kinds of ways, some involving physical situations, um, the, and, 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 the clear, and the cleansing of that is different from say thinking in an impure kind of way, all right. So I mean, you're right. Purity is a word that tries to describe um, a, a state that is, uh, generally speaking, uh, well, a negative a negative state. To try and find another word to describe it, but sometimes it's important to be in an impure state. Sometimes it's necessary to become impure. Uh, we know that. Um, with the ashes of the red heifer, the people that were involved in in that preparation process all became impure. But the ashes of the red heifer were there to cleanse someone from a very, very high state of impurity. And by the way, it again has to do with being in contact with a corpse. So we're back into this issue of immortality that I was referring to. And But the people that would be involved in, uh, in the preparation of the ashes of the red heifer, while they became impure, their impurity was on a much lower kind of level, right? So mm. basically a very simple, very simple way in which one can cleanse oneself is to go to the mikveh and, and basically wait until nightfall, right? So again, what that symbolism represents, et cetera, but there's also the impurity simply of acting in ways that are sinful and to understand that those sinful ways are ways in which we reduce the possibility of us being able to go through this life and move into the next life. Oh. To pass through safely this particular life that we're living in right now. So it's a, mm. it's a whole different way of looking at life. It's not a way most people look at life. That's quite honest. I don't believe most people do, but it is it is the way that Torah is trying to get us to re to rethink the significance of our lives. So here we're talking about, you know, someone the priests had to maintain, I mean, they had a lot of privileges, but a lot of along with those privileges came a lot of responsibilities and the need to be very, very punctilious about their behavior. And again, you know, so we have within Buddhism, for example, the need to be mindful about how you behave and not to just let emotions carry you through and try to be thoughtful. So part of these, these processes involved being very, very thoughtful about what you're doing. And again, part of what's involved there is maybe valuing life in a deeper kind of way and appreciating just to what degree life is a miracle and and very, very, very precious. So that might be a good place for me to stop the recording now.